Record. Yep. Okay. So I'm just getting us connected. Uh, while I am doing that, I'm wondering if uh, we, looks like we got uh, four other people on the line. I was wondering if you could uh, briefly introduce yourselves. This is Jeffrey Brownson, by the way. Okay. I guess I'll start out. Uh, my name is Scott Sibatari. I'm currently in Connecticut. Uh, and yeah. Great. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, <laughs> This is Sean Yora over in California. Hey, Sean. Uh, you're one of the reasons why I made sure it was like at 2 o'clock, not 11 o'clock. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yep. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, this is Rich Rogan, Northeastern Pennsylvania. Hi, Rich. Welcome. Hey, is Scott showing up as C-I-A-B-A-S? Is that, is that what yeah. you Okay. Got it. Yeah, this is Daniel from Indiana. Daniel, welcome. You got this all started off for us. So it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm having a lot of problems with this. So I need help. Really. No problem. We we I want to make sure that you get help. Absolutely. All right. All right. Uh anybody uh, so that should be one, two, three, four of us, right? Uh, not including me. That is yes. okay. So what I'm doing, uh folks, is uh Jen. Uh, sent a note asking that I record uh, this. So uh, provided that that's all right with all of you, I'll just have this re uh, session recorded. We'll answer questions um, and uh, then we could share it back out and any new discoveries that we make, uh, we can uh, at least share. Is that all right? Yeah, anybody? I think that's a great, yeah, idea. That's great. Okay, okay, because it is something that we can do. Uh, and so I'm just giving it a shot. I want to give the class as much help and support uh, as possible, knowing that not everybody can be everywhere at the exactly the same time across many time zones. Okay. So before I've been, I've been spending several hours kind of going in, looking at ways to approach this problem of integration. Uh, but before even getting to that, I was wondering if uh, we could first address uh, some of Daniel's uh, general questions about getting in, getting access uh, inside of Jupiter. I think Daniel, uh, last week we asked, we answered some of these questions for folks, but I'd really like to take care of that first for you. Okay. And you should see uh, Jupiter up on my screen here. Uh, I've, I've been flipping back and forth between tabs. Is that correct? Yeah, I see. Okay, great. Um, so what I noticed uh, just very recently, I don't know if it's because a bunch of us are trying to use Jupyter Hub, was that Jupyter Hub has been, for me, uh, was not uh, running certain cells. So I switched, so you, you will see me running Python on my local computer. So it might look slightly different than what you have, but I just wanted, I did that on purpose to make sure that if, if something like this happened, I'd have backup. Okay, Daniel, go ahead. So right now, uh, when I open Jupyter uh, right now, yeah. I don't know even how to navigate. Ah, okay. Computer. Let me. Can I do something? Can I? I've stopped sharing, and okay. if you go to your main screen, if you've got a computer up uh, with a web browser, you could just go share screen, uh, hit that share screen button, and then you could either share just your desktop. Oftentimes, that's the easiest thing, or the Firefox, Chrome, whatever you're using as your web browser. And then it'll pop up in front of us. Right now, I click on next up, share screen. Yep. We should get in just a second here. There we go. Starting up, perfect. Okay, so for example, you're in Firefox. Uh, so let's open up your Firefox browser really quickly. And there we go. So let's try to open the Jupyter Hub link for you. Um, so if you're doing that, what do you have the link for the Jupyter Hub? Yeah, I have to go to the, the email you sent us the last time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then click on that and it will launch you directly. Okay, so... Let me do this. If I go to mine and you go ahead, you go ahead and start that process, but I'm, I, it's a, the 
email should be ju or the the address should mm -hmm. just be jupiterhub.ems.psu.edu. That's it. Okay. Let's see if I can push this. In. <laughs> There we go. I just pushed it in the, the chat. So if you can see your chat icon, you can just click on that. Where can I find it, sir? Oh, that's a great question. So if, uh, so I think what we want to do is uh, actually, uh, Daniel, why don't you just type into your uh, address, just mm -hmm. uh, Jupiter Hub dot ems dot psu dot edu. Okay. I think I have to do that real quick. Yep, that's it. Just hit enter. And there you're in. Okay. So I'm um, just looking at this screen. You're going to be clicking on the, the folder tab that says bird clear sky model. There we go. Um, and so you can see all of the data here. If I click on bird clear sky model IPNB, that's the actual notebook that we're navigating. And it all automatically always opens it into a new tab. Now, it should take a few seconds, like it did, to get started. And the kernel, that little blue thing said kernel ready, go up to the, that same upper right corner where it says not trusted uh, in your upper right. There you go. Just click on that. And then say trust. OK. Now, when it loads up, so the kernel you'll see in the upper right, that little signal for kernel uh, should go from Python 3, should go to a, 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 an open circle like you're seeing right next to Python 3. Then you're good to go. You go over to, yeah, exactly. Once that, once right next to Python 3, that circle is an open circle, you have, you're connected to the server to the, uh, to the kernel. And it's just waiting to do some work. That's why it says kernel idle when you're uh, over it. Now, if you go to the menu, and you see kernel, just click on that and hit uh, restart and run all. There we go, and hit yes. And this is just gonna run it from the top down. Each time, one, it'll run the cells in sequence, so you'll see that the, for example, at the very top, it'll say like one, like IN one. That means that's the first cell it ran. So now scroll down because it's run all of this information for you. And scroll to the, uh, a little bit further down and you should see a lot of, lot of output and stuff like that. Okay, so for right now, um, you're seeing what we are all seeing, uh, Daniel. Is there any question beyond that for the moment? I never even logged into this place before. Okay, okay. So <laughs> I'm gonna say um, let's work through as a group uh, the problems that uh, the majority of the people are talking about. And if uh, later on, as we move through this, uh, I know you need to get off at about three o'clock, I think, Daniel. But I'd be glad to uh, also uh, work with you on this a uh, little bit separately. Okay. Uh, so I mean, uh, even even another time if 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 we run out of time for that. All right. Okay. Would you mind uh, going to stop sharing and then I will share my screen. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. So here we go, folks. Uh, now we're seeing very much the same thing. We're going to go into the bird clear sky model uh, on mine. Um, well, actually, no, I don't want to do the remote one. That's a, one of the challenges. I want to do local just uh, so that I don't bog things down. Okay, so I've got um, in here, I'm running the bird clear sky model. I downloaded it, which is why the title seems a little bit weird. 
and I'm gonna just uh, restart and run all, uh, actually, run all cells, uh, so that my, you'll notice like if you run all of the cells without the restart and run all, what happens is the first cell becomes the next cell that you run. So it's restart and run all is basically just uh, doing that. It's it's grabbing. Uh, hold on a second. I think it's because I just logged on to the online version. Okay. Let's see if I can do this. So, start clear output. I'll run all in one second here. Okay. Oh, that, that's not good. All right. Hang on one second, folks. So what I'm trying to do is I flipped back and forth between the two uh, notebooks, and I think the my personal computer didn't know which which engine it was supposed to be pointing at. So I'm going to bear with me one second. Um, while we're doing this, there we go. Um, general questions on the learning activity. Uh, I'll, I'll just open up the floor here for uh, Sean or Rich or any of the other guys that have been putting in a couple of posts earlier. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, this is Sean. I, <clears throat> I guess I just got um, confused on how to grab some of the data from the, from the table that you provided. Right. Like the, cause we need the solar. Yeah. DW solar data from the table, um, right. you know, for certain values of N, I guess. Right. Um, and I just didn't know what functions to use. And I, and I, I think I can help you with that one. Excellent. Okay. So I'm making a note of that, um, that, that manipulating the data is, is one of the things that you're, uh, like, how do you select out data the way that you would just copy and paste cells in Excel? Is that yeah, I saw, I saw the code that you used to like read the table, right? Like, uh, you know, and to provide the output of all the, of all the rows and columns, but I didn't understand how to take a certain column out of that and yep. kind of put that into the function, you know, the integration function. Um, so that, that part was a little confusing to me. Okay. I can, that, I, I think I have a line on that will help you. Okay. Um, uh, Rich, any follow up on that? Well, I guess, I guess my, I mean, I, I can go through the code and in, in general, I can kind of tell what it's doing. Right. Um, uh, but I think as Sean expressed, I mean, I, I wouldn't, if I had to write this, it would, it would take me a month. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that really is why we want, I wanted like something like this, like some zoom sessions and forums to pop up so that we could collectively go at it and, and just bring everybody up to a level mm -hmm. because one, in this class, I don't want you to necessarily spend a month programming. I would love it if we could uh, use our kind of collective knowledge and, and find the solution to this particular problem and, and then move on, knowing that this Python's uh, coding is out there and that the, we can develop an appreciation for it. But uh, so the la this last step of the bird clear sky model of just doing integration is the one that I wanted us to kind of just work on because basically the idea of integrating data itself is um, a pretty useful uh, thing to know how to do inside of Python. So, yep, I hear what you're saying. And I, and again, I think I can, can address that uh, in our conversation. Anybody else on, on discussion topics? I'm just, uh, again, just trying to get things to yeah, work my, here. My, this is Daniel. Yes. Since I'm very new to this kind of software, right. I just wanted how to use it with respect to what I'm learning in uh, so in the class. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't want to learn how to program. I just yep. want to do it. And I think I think that's what I really want us to kind of keep our eye on is 
not necessarily to learn how to program, but kind of going along Rich's line. I can look at it. I can see pretty much what's going on. Um, and, and we're trying to do both this in lesson two and lesson three with Python. Um, and I'm trying to provide the code for you uh, with the exception of just this last step. But even this last step, it's looking like um, in the future, I, I should be providing some uh, additional uh, code for that. So I, I'm, I'm here to work on that with you guys as well. Okay, good. Um, so for whatever reason, my uh, uh, local Python wasn't working. So I'm, I'm back online on the uh, kernel in Jupyter Hub with everybody else. So I'm waiting for the kernel to start up and then we'll get uh, running the cells. Okay. Kernel starting, please wait. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm just watching this uh, connecting to kernel uh, aspect. As, and as I can see, I've got a broken connection to the kernel, which is what I was talking about earlier. And to be, just to double check, there it is. Uh, none of you are getting this message. No. Okay. No, I don't know that issue. Good, 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 good. Okay, so then it's just me, which is unfortunate, but it's better for it to be me than you guys. Um, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a quick log out. Whoops. And hit okay. I'm gonna log back in and approach this from a different angle. Um, so essentially what I found while we were working on um, the Jupiter aspects and token of things. Let me double check here. All right. Save. I had everything working just a second ago. So let's get the Jupyter notebook up. There we go. And I'll go back into box to our classroom and get the file. EMEA 10 and data and rubrics code. Okay. Um, and a quick split back here so that we're sharing screen with you. Okay. So if I go down to here. Execute that code. That looks like we're good to go. All right. So now I'm going to run all cells. Yeah, we don't care about this. Ah, that's why it was doing it. It's because it didn't know that this is marked down. Marked down. There we go. Okay. Moving on. So it wasn't the server, it was just the fact that we're not connected to the special grader that I use. Okay, we start and run all cells. Now we should get, I should be going up to the top and seeing one, two, three, yes. All right. So uh, some of the things that I wanted to uh, point out here is that the data that like if I get down to where the first, so we're creating a data frame called bird. I mean, data frame in our case would be like the spreadsheet that we're all uh, look, uh, looking at, uh, looking at, looking at sky model. Now my table is a little older version than, than what you guys have access to, so it looks slightly different than yours, but it still has the day of the year, the hour, the hour angle, uh, and so forth, working its way across. Uh, can I confirm that with you guys that you are seeing something quite similar? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So, and I'm I'm just doing this in steps until we get down to the integrating because um, 
uh, I, I want to make very sure that everybody is, is following along. So um, if I test for day 212 as July 31st, I am plotting that data as the bird clear sky model. Then I go to the next part where I, I want to pull out the SurfRAD data, which is data that, ha that you have already downloaded in your bird clear sky model folder. And we have the headers of the columns of data and the, the data itself for day 212 of uh, year seven. One question about that. So do, yeah. if it's in, if that data file is in, as is one of the files in the Jupyter right. notebook, do we have right. to, can we just leave it there or do we have to save that on you our desktop? Just leave it there. All it, okay, okay. Yeah, you can just leave it there. So you are just fine. And Okay. For whatever reason, my screen just died. All right, hang on a second. Yes, and that, that I'm really glad you asked that question because um, it's hard to make that kind of leap and say, oh, oh well, this data is already there. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do anything. Um, and the ideally, what we're talking about is the only thing that we're quote unquote doing is running the cells, trying to interpret what the cells are doing writing about that and then the and then integrating to find the the kt values the, um, so does that answer the question so far yeah got it okay uh and and i do believe we've got the january day for extra credit also just tucked into the data set so you should have no downloads no nothing uh extra credit would be in this case just going back in and um, trying to change the date, essentially. A few other things, but anyway. All right, so if I go down to pulling in the SurfRed data, I'm trying to get back to where I was before my browser just crashed. Um, sorry if this is making you dizzy scrolling. Um, there we go. All right, so there's my clear sky plot. Now I have my SurfRed plot with column headers and the data, and this is where we have created a new data frame, you know, or you think of it as a spreadsheet in some ways, um, but we're calling it SurfRad and instead of Bird. So the data frame that was Bird was a data, uh, a, basically like a spreadsheet of data for the Clear Sky model. This is the spreadsheet or data frame for the SurfRad data uh, that we're pulling down. Um, and so I've got another big table of data. Uh, because um, Pandas, the, the type of software that we're using to work with large data sets, which is very common in, in Python, because uh, they try not to print every cell of data, you have this dot, dot, dot in the middle of your data frame table, okay? Which is good in that you don't have to look at thousands of data cells but it's also a little more complicated when you want to just look and explore what type of data you want to select out. Um, and I've got an idea for how we can work through that, not as Python programming experts, but as people trying to find a solution uh, to these integrating problems. So, so just, just a quick question there. So please, you know, please. Those, uh, the various surf red, we're, we're, we're running calculations and we're populating this spreadsheet or two dimensional array. Um, yeah. And then in uh, what is line, okay, the lines do match now, in uh, input 46, just right. entering SurfRed causes the uh, the printing of that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it, okay. Yeah, so kind of like uh, if I made a variable A and it was a list of a few data points, and in Python, if I just type A and hit shift enter, I get it fed back to me. Think of SurfRed as just a big old mega variable. So if I, I mean, a data frame. So if the data frame SurfRad is typed in and hit enter, it automatically prints out the whole thing. And so if I go back down here, I'm gonna insert a cell below. So, uh, oops, let me cut that. If I go right to the SurfRad one, I'm gonna insert a cell below just as a demonstration. And so you see SurfRad right here. So the, the what is the other data frame that we have? Bird. 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 Yeah. So let's just do that. So I'm typing bird. I'm going to hit shift enter. And there it is. 
So if I wanted to do a quick comparison of headers between these two, I'll notice one, they're not the same, which is fine, but it's, it is a way to just call up a variable and take a look at it. Oh my gosh. Well, we lost you again. Yeah, this is, this is, I'm wondering if I don't have a, a bug in my laptop because my laptop seems to be the only one that is losing connectivity um, over the semester. So let me go back to this screen. Well, this is embarrassing. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so that, that's a starting point to answer your question, right, Rich? Yes. I think you were saying that. Okay, great. If you want to view just, yeah, like I think what we're getting to is like one column within that. Right. Um, it's, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I'm curious to see what that function would look like. All right, you got it. So I'll show you because because that is that was exactly the next step I wanted to show. Yeah, that was exactly um, my question, how to pull that data from the set. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. So if I wanted to uh, just get so let's look at that column of data. If I wanted to just get uh, instead of surfrad all by itself, let's insert below. If I wanted to get surfrad. What column do you, would you be interested in? <clears throat> There's a typo there, Sir Fred. Oh, thank, thanks so much. All right, so let's say like um, DW Solar, mm -hmm. downwelling solar. So I put it, it's a type of way to grab a column by the heading. I'm putting it in square brackets with single, um, single quotes. If I do that, I won't get the fancy output, but I will get the list of those are the irradiance values from, from step zero down to step 479. <clears throat> okay, so yeah. we, have to use, we have to use single quotes if we're pulling one of these columns. That, that's the best way to grab it practically okay. right now. Um, now, the, uh, you will see that same type of work up yeah. here, right? So when we're calling a column, we're basically using those single quotes. And, and we can do math manipulation of it, which you're seeing in this cell 36, where the diffuse horizontal is mm -hmm. going to be the, the column-wise subtraction of direct horizontal minus, you know, or global horizontal minus direct horizontal. So if, even in looking at that and starting to, it's like the way that Python also interacts, which is, once you have the right syntax, oh my goodness, uh, setting it up is, is basically just basic math. Um, okay, so hold on a second, because I'm trying to walk us through in steps and keep on getting buggy responses. Um, the, so, so that's pulling one column down. Now I'm gonna do exactly that same thing provided my uh, browser doesn't die on me uh again for grabbing those that time interval that that everybody's interested in so um let's see if i've already got it yeah i've already got it entered in so if i go down that's a good point even though this crashed it's, the server still recalled everything should have so i have uh that dw solar now what i'm doing is i went in and i'm gonna add Import sci-fi. Let's see if I can put this over into the chat as well. So Import sci -fi. Are you sharing that? Uh, so, so right now I'm just uh, pay, cut and pasting over into the chat. Oh, okay. Import sci-fi and import sci-fi integrate so that you guys have a quick way to look at this. And then this, so this is, um, this is one of the ways that I would try integrating, which is to just use the integrating function using Simpson's rule, but you're gonna integrate the whole column of data of say DW solar, and it gives you a really large number. <clears throat> um, that's not really what I want. I want now to down select the group of rows. So I'm gonna create a data frame that's just gonna be a set number of rows, and then I could integrate across those rows. So, and, and what I'm gonna do, uh, everyone, is take the file that I have where I've added these cells and I'm gonna push that back up to you, okay? 
So, uh, but, but for right now, if I were to do, so I already told you how to do Surfrad, grab a column. If I wanted to do the Surfrad da uh, data frame and grab rows of data, I'm doing it using just uh, addresses of the number of the row. So cell for row 140 down to row uh, 161. And if I were to do that selection, I get what appears to be the right time, which is like seven hour, seven hours, zero minutes to eight hours, zero minutes, seven to eight o'clock or so it seems. Um, and I could uh, then uh, do a sub, you know, define a sub array, a uh, sub data frame of just the surf, all of the, all the columns, but the, just the data from like 140 to 161. And I could look at and what I'm doing here is I'm looking at, well, what is the actual local time? The first couple of columns show that it says it's seven o'clock. The problem is it's surfrad data. And so it's UTC zero data. So that the actual local time is one o'clock in the morning. And in which case, if I were to do an integration of that downwelling solar time, I get a negative number because I'm basically integrating a whole bunch of variability at night. So that's not going to be the right cells that I'm going for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. So that was like, okay, hold on. I thought Surfred data says you uh, local time and all this stuff. Um, so what I did, and this is what I mean by, uh, doing a, a more of a, a brute force exploration of the data than to worry about finding the, the finessed code for how do we get the right times was I said, okay, well, if, uh, if 140 to 161, which I arbitrarily chose, gives me one o'clock in the morning, let's just try for 240 and 261. I know that the surf red data is three minutes apart. And so 20 rows will be one hour of data just because three times 20 is 60 minutes. So I'm going to grab 240 to 241. It starts at six, six, you know, about 630, 640 in the morning, ends at about 630, 640 at night. So I'm getting close. And, and again, this for me was just some quick hunting and, and shifting until I find that the surf rad cells 246 to 267 will give me seven o'clock to eight o'clock. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm just struggling here because are you sharing? Yeah. Are you sharing? I'm not seeing. Oh, you. Oh, 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 is that what, Oh my goodness. Hold on a second. <coughs> oh my, my. All right. I, I Back in. The hair was good. Oh. <laughs> oh, thanks guys. All right. Trying that one more time. If you, now you can see, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so you see surf rad 140 to 161. In, in in the input 69 that I've just added. Yep. Okay, so that looks like seven o'clock in the morning is the start on day seven or month seven, day 31 to eight o'clock. Looks like it's all right, all good to go. If I integrate that data, and I'll, I'll talk about how we can integrate uh, just using Simpson's rule, uh, where there's three minutes step between here, I get a very weird uh, number for the whole data set. But if I grab, if I create a sub data set, a sub data frame of surf sub that is between 140 and 161, I think that I'm good to go, except that my integral is now a negative sign, yep. which it can't be right. And so this is what I'm just writing notes in for everybody when I do share this back out. I'm defining a new subset of SurfRad that's not, not going to be, I mean, that I've got 140 to 161, and I'm going to check the local time. So I'm going to do exactly what uh, Sean was asking, which is like, what if I just wanted to pull out a column of data? And so I'm going to get the T local time, and I'm going to see that T local, even though it says that the time on my table is 7 o'clock in the morning, it's actually 7 o'clock in the morning 
UTC, <clears throat> Greenwich time. Oh, okay. That's what I mean. And so, so in reality, T local has embedded in it the actual watch time. So, so this is where all of that watch time conversion actually matters is it's telling you UTC and we're going to shift everything over to longitudinal shifts such that we're uh, five time zones over from that. We're in daylight savings time and uh, we have some uh, main, a few minutes of shifting as well. So in, if I wanted to find that, I did a little bit of hunting and pecking to get to 20 cells apart was cell or row 246 to row 267. And I'm gonna uh, text that back out to you guys. And you just that figured that out through trial and error? That one I did because I, there was, again, it was like, if I wanted to look at the whole data set and just scan through it, I would, the way that I look at it is I would, I would have to go really quickly and figure out how does Surfrad or how does uh, Python Pandas print an entire data set and scroll through all that data until I found seven o'clock T local time. Whereas it's already going to print out when you, whenever you grab a data frame column, you're already guaranteed to get eight data points out. And so I just did a quick search of uh, like in the hundreds and then narrowed it down very quickly until I found <laughs> the time that I was looking for. So just, just to let you know, it's not everything in here is, is finesse. We're at this point, we're also wanting to just get to how do we use this tool to just find the answer. Um, so I, I've narrowed it down to 246 to 267. And that's where you're seeing these, these cells right here. So then that sub set of surf sub is all of this, the data frame from surf. It's basically down selecting the data frame to only include rows 246 to 267. And so then I'm gonna do the integration here of that surf sub set. And I'm still uh, suggesting that I have uh, three steps per integral. In which case, if I run this, I will get a, a value of uh, 25,538. Now, my guess is that that is actually uh, scaled slightly wrong and that we're looking at probably 2.55 megajoules. Um, but for right now, I wanted to answer the question of how would, first, how do you grab out a column of data? Second, how do you actually pull out rows of data to target the exact times that you're looking for? Questions or discussion? So we'll basically have to do that same manipulation for 1 to 2 p.m. Right. Yeah. But what I think, what I, what I would like to do is actually just do that for you and just send out the cells to you guys, if that's all right. <clears throat> yeah, I think that part what isn't very intuitive because I, I nope. think I assume that the I think, right. time, I think the time, I think I assumed the time was already in solar time and we didn't. Right. Have yeah. To do that, so. Exactly. So that's where I think that we can do, I, I'd be happy to, to grab those and push those out to you for those two times. So right now we know that uh, 246 to 267 are the rows for seven o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock local time. Um, if, um, if we were, go ahead, oh, sorry. Yeah, so I'm kind of following what you are explaining to me. I'm right. very, very new to this one. So sure. I'll be very, very happy just to be like uh, expected right now. So after that, I can still kind of have one-on-one -on -one, uh, Zoom chat with sure. you too. Sounds good. Yeah, okay. I, that's perfect. Um, you know, Sean, you just raised a good point. Um, if I'm looking at the data, this is T, this is my uh, surf rat plot of T local on the y axis. The 
PW Solar, Net Solar Diffuse hour change versus hour on the bird model. Um, yep, no, I'm, I'm still, I would still say that we would be grabbing the cells from seven to eight using T local time um, as, our, as our search based off of this plot where the X axis is gonna be T local, Mr. Fred plot. I know what you mean by um, if you were to just assume it was uh, solar time alone, then you would just have an hour based, you would seemingly just have an hour based shift, but that would be an hour based, like uh, say UTC to Eastern time zone is uh, minus five hours. The, so we'd move 75 degrees west. But in addition to that, State College is um, another several degrees into the Eastern time zone. And so when our solar noon occurs is, um, is locally going to be uh, like about 78 degrees, I believe, off <laughs> of what we were talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I understand the, yeah. the, the time so it's, so, you're doing. Yeah, so, so it's, not, it's not that it's specifically watch time. It actually is solar time, but it's a, the longitudinal shift makes it different than the UTC uh, that is printed out for the, the time, the data set. Anyone else on that, on, just on that note alone? Okay, so the, the other step that, uh, in addition to manipulating that, is to actually, uh, so integrating the numerator, on, uh, I will be glad to put out the method that I'm finding for integrating the numerator. Now I know that Sean and Rich, you guys are both using kind of a direct, discrete method for integration, correct? No, it was Rich, I, I haven't even gotten that step. Okay, okay. But Sean, you have been trying that, correct? <clears throat> I was trying, well, I, I tried, actually the, I was looking at what Randy did. He did a trapezoidal. Oh, Randy, okay, sorry about that, Rich. I was confusing you with Randy. Go ahead. Yeah, so that he did the integrate dot traps. Right. And trying to do it for the, the GHI and, and time right. balance. It. But I was still, I was still confused at that point exactly, uh, or as far as how to call the data. So, but I, I get that part now. Okay, so what I will be doing uh, after we get off of this is following the forum throughout the day, going back and forth, because yes, you could use TrapZ very easily. I'm using Simpsons just because uh, it, it at, for no, no reason other than that, uh, it's also in several uh, help files but Trapsy is, is gonna be perfect for this as well. Uh, we're defining a pretty slowly changing uh, curve data, and so Trapsy should work just fine. And, and okay. the data, that, that equation you just did for data, data surf divided by yes. 10 to the fourth, what is that for? So that was for me an, a quick exploration because I've gotten as far as looking at this where what is the scale of the data coming out? And I'll show you what I'm talking about relative to what should be in the denominator. So if I go to the denominator, which is the, the I naught calculation. Mm -hmm. um, so I naught morning, for example, it's gonna happen um, where I'm going to have 12 times 12 hours, uh, a, a half day of 12 hours times 3,600 seconds per hour divided by pi. And in Python, if I want pi, I'm going <clears> to <throat> do psi pi dot pi. I'm going to multiply it times the normal radiation hitting the Earth's surface, which is why I've got this cell up here that the solar constant is 1,361. Uh, watts per square meter, the G naught, the extraterrestrial irradiance normal to the surface of the sun on that day of, of uh, the 
the 200th uh, day of the year is going to be 1,321 watts per square meter. Did you? And then I've got. Go ahead. Did you define n underscore July uh, so, up above somewhere? So uh, what I did was I. I'll show you what I did. Yeah, I went. Oh, okay. And July is 212, and uh, and I did that same pulling out a column. I went to the subset of SurfRad data, pulled out the declination column, and then I noticed that, which is appropriate, declination doesn't change over the course of the day. So I just grabbed out 18.34 as my declination and just plugged it in, in lowercase symbols, and so that it would just fit my normal uh, equations. <laughs> so here's the, here's the day of the year, and then the declination fits right in there, along with other uh, data points. Uh, because I'm looking at seven o'clock in the morning to, to eight o'clock in the morning, I also defined my hour angles. Hang for right now is hour angles of the morning, hour angles of the morning stopping, and I've filled in this equation. But so here's where it comes back to that division aspect. So if I print my answer for I, for the irradiation hitting outside of the atmosphere, the top of atmosphere from seven to eight o'clock, I get a very large number, which I've written about in the textbook, that it is a number in terms of joules. If I wanted to convert that to megajoules, I will need to divide my answer by 10 to the sixth. And so I get this answer of 2.28 megajoules. So long answer for going back to what you were talking about, which was, hold on a second, why did we do a 10 to the four uh, division? And it, and it basically is me looking at the integration <laughs> function for Simpsons and going, okay, where, where are we really at on the map for, for units? And so for me, that's why I'm, I'm specifically wondering about this DX3, uh, where, where I'm assuming that there are three minutes between every step of X uh, versus, let's say, DX1, which would give me a much smaller number. So I'm going to be looking at those two to see if I can't uh, find a, a really good uh, fix for the coding of the numerator. But the denominator is, is basically a, a very straightforward uh, answer right here. But we could just do the numerator divided by the denominator and then divide by 10 to the six at the end. Is that right? Uh, potentially, if they, if they are both uh, divided by, well, if they're both 10 to the six, then you'll get the right answer. I mean, if they're both in terms of joules, right. then you will get the right answer because it's a ratio, yeah. And um, the numerator I, should, should be in joules, right? That's what I thought. And that's why I'm, I'm um, curious more about what I'm doing in the integration function than this 10 to the fourth. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not recommending that anybody uses the 10 to the fourth in here. I'm just, uh, I ran out of time uh, by the time I got to this point to pull this together. Uh, it, I mean, the, the idea here was if you wanted the SciPy integrate function, what needed to happen when there was a, uh, it, this was an interesting discovery that just importing SciPy would not bring in the integrate function. We specifically had to integrate, bring, uh, for me, I had to specifically bring in SciPy.integrate. And then everything worked uh, and I could uh, move forward with uh, TrapZ or Simpsons or otherwise. Um, and that was just my personal method of, of working through the numerator part of the problem. And really, the, the hard part of this last section is finding the numerator, not necessarily finding the denominator, because the denominator is a math equation with some pretty straight up, straightforward variables. The, the, the hard part is exactly what Sean and Randy and Rich and, and Scott and everybody have been trying to do, which is how do I just grab that, that row, those columns of data, and, and integrate. And we're almost there.
in the the hour angles you just um you're just using the standard hour angle equation that's right yep from from the perspective of where we're at uh seven o'clock is going to be uh minus 75 degrees from solar noon okay yeah Other questions? Just quick question. So the the big bit of sheet will be given to you in, in the file that you have. Yeah, it's, it's it it is already there. So the so there's no moving data around. There's no anything. The um, the really the only thing that we need to do is to put together what are KT the clearness indices for seven to eight o'clock in the morning and uh, one to two o'clock in the afternoon. I believe that's correct for those uh, for this July day. <clears throat> and is the, the bottom values that that's not, that's not your KT value, right? That is not, that is uh, yeah. So that you're talking about it, where I'm have the input in cell 67 here. Yeah. The, the answer of say yeah. 2.28, megajoules that is the that right now is the denominator because that oh, is okay. that is okay right 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 um so what i again what i would like to do is to uh turn this process into something that because because uh, i fully admit that it is challenging is to turn this process into the scenario where all of us uh, all the students can converge together on the right answers and nobody's going to get uh, doctor dinged for not understanding all of the, the code, but we're actually converging on um, how do we grab some data out of Python and uh, how do we get the ratio of the clearness index? Because we're gonna come back to this clearness index in lesson four. <laughs> and it's going to be, uh, at that point, we will, the calculation for the clearness index will be done for you in uh, in the, the the next set of code that we have in R. I'm following, I'm following, but it is thinking gradually. Oh yeah, yeah. So and and the so the the thing is is what's going to happen is. Uh, like we're, we're, we're deep in the weeds right now. Let's pull this back out and think about where, where things are going. The, the idea is that a clearness index is a way to tell what is the interference of the sky without uh, patches of clouds, like the sky, whether it's overcast or crystal clear blue, has some sort of interaction with the sun from where the sun hits the top of the atmosphere just outside of space, that's the top of atmosphere or air mass zero point. Uh, and then it travels through the atmosphere at an angle at a certain point in time of the day. And so it's got a longer and longer path length that will change how much light gets down to us at the surface. And that would be like, um, what we measure. So we're calculating a clear sky in our denominator for an hour. We are trying to extract out the data of what we actually measured on a horizontal surface at the ground. Generally for these days, like you, if I scroll back here, let's look at this. Okay, so here is seven o'clock, right? And here is eight o'clock and looking at the bird clear sky model overlaid with the surfrad data. So what would be, looking at that data, what would be your guess of the clearness index? Yeah, knowing that zero means it's basically the sky has totally obscured the sun and about the highest that you get, because there's always some atmospheric interaction is about 0.8. <clears throat> on a very, very, very clear sky day. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably say it's between, yeah, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 
I mean, it's pretty right. closely fitting the data, uh, fitting the model. So exactly. I mean, the only thing that's happening in here is the real data for the diffuse at seven to eight o'clock is a little bit under under the predicted value, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and here's the beam, and the beam is a little bit over predicting, uh, or the, the the real beam is a little bit greater than what is predicted in orange here. And similarly, if Go ahead. The, for the diffuse, because you're using the, probably going to butcher the name, the, the pyranometer? Oh, pyr pyranometer. You know what? It's, <laughs> it, that, that is, those two words are ones that you have to hear in person. No textbook gets, can tell you. Uh, yeah, it's a pyranometer. And pyranometer. The, yeah. Yep, and, go ahead. And so is that, is the way, because I, I was reading the textbook, it, it said it had the, it was kind of vague, but it said it had a shading tool on it to yeah. the, the so, direct beam it, and just measure the, the right. radiant. Is, is, the, is it because of the tool that they use that the estimation is under the... Um, in this case, this is just, so the, the bird, this is a great discussion point. The bird clear sky model is just estimating what it should be based on the chemistry of the air okay, and, and the time of the day. And that's it. And it's uh, the measurement is what is really there uh, locally. And so uh, the, it's not the error of, you're talking about a, what's called a rotating shadow band detector. Uh, so a, a band blocks out the direct, the pyranometer is still mounted horizontally, a, an arc or a band is going to block the beam of the sun. And so the only thing it measures is the diffuse in that case. Um, and so, and, and it will, so it will measure the total and it will measure the diffuse and then they will use math to find out what the direct on a horizontal should be. <laughs> Got it. So that, yeah. The measure diffuse, it's not an error of the instrument. It's just, uh, that's Correct. what it actually is. Right. And, and that's, that is like where I really would like us to go. I mean, this again is a great reason for having like a, a zoom session like this is to just look at it and say, one is a model and, and, and it has no inputs other than what we basically think the aerosols are in the sky and what does the air chemistry. The other one is really measuring what is happening on a horizontal surface. Um, and this becomes really important be, as we'll see in next lesson because we're modeling and we're measuring for horizontal surfaces. But the typical measuring device is a single pyranometer for a horizontal surface and it's not enough information necessarily to actually make uh, an estimation of my components of light diffuse and direct on a tilted photovoltaic array because a tilted photovoltaic on a rooftop say is not horizontal and so it's interacting with the cosine projection differently the glass on the surface of the uh, pyranometer was going to reflect light and and but the weird part is all of this kind of calculation work that we're doing is embedded in the tools like the SAM uh, system advisor model software tool with and and it's basically wrapped up in black box as if we have ultimate confidence in all of these calculations and conversions and what we will find is that there is error embedded in it but it's not it's not embedded here it's embedded more in the um uh the way that we translate the horizontal data into data on a tilted array and, and my screen finally Gave up the ghost. Yep, we lost you again. Yep. All right. So, um, so again, the take homes on this are going to be uh, closer to uh, asking ourselves, you know, where are sources of error in measuring solar resource data uh, to linked to these modeling estimations? Uh, to understand that we're just clipping off the tip of the iceberg for the um, uh, 
processing of basically very large data sets in, uh, in general in solar. And I'm trying to give an exposure to these real data sets, knowing that they're really challenging to work with, uh, to generate a bit of appreciation for, say, the meteorologists that we hope to partner with in our firms. And, and the value that they bring to the table in people who are used to manipulating large data sets like this. So we, the, the, one of those goals of the course is to move into some real data sets, look at what's happening to develop some appreciation so that in the last uh, half of the class, when we're basically just using the tools directly, we know what's under the hood, we know what that, that, that it, there's a real challenge in there and we have delivered for you guys a, a certain amount of skepticism about whether we should take the data for what it is as like an estimation or as some financial folks do take it as if it's like reality <laughs> and and that the, the main challenge in in project development is to convey that there are many parts of solar project development that are um, low risk but the way that we given that that the solar resource is our basically our our fuel and knowing the octane level equivalent for the fuel that we have is going to tell us how well the system will perform over time we, I, I want you guys to have exposure to knowing that that's not a, a necessarily a very simple question to to answer but it does require computational tools, which is again why we're working in uh, a Python framework rather than say an Excel spreadsheet. <clears throat> yeah, I think for me the I you know I definitely understand the concepts and stuff. I think it's just getting bogged down in the the coding sometimes can be challenging. Yeah, so I am um, fully supportive of you guys being very upfront with when the coding is, is getting too deep into the weeds. Um, we have a big spectrum of, of skill sets every semester in this class from people who are very, very familiar to Python to people who they're just encountering it right now. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, like Daniel and, and, and I'm trying that. And my, my point is to try to, alleviate some of that pressure given the, the broad spectrum of skill sets by in these particular tasks, trying to take away the aspect of it that um, I am tr not necessarily trying to assess your skill in Python. I am, and which is why most of what we're looking at is putting in information about into the discussion forum of, of what what is being done in this code and what is what are we actually interpreting out of it um, and again with the aspect of us using uh jupiter and python for the first time in this space um there are uh new challenges that that we're becoming aware of by you guys all jumping in at different levels uh which i'm trying to address as soon as possible and as as and that's a, a big reason for me uh, making myself available as many times and as often as uh, as it as it takes to help out. Yeah, so I have a comment to make. So yeah. the, the biggest reason why I joined this program was to enrich my knowledge base as a consultant for renewable energy companies. So many sure. times I go for conferences and they come out with some a project projection and you have to estimate why the person is going to invest his capital into and what right. he is going to get in returns of what projection you are going to make. Right. So many times we, we take data sets, compute, and then kind of estimate it. So okay, if you do this X, Y, Z amount of investment for this amount of years, this is how your return of investment is going to be. Blah, blah, blah. Right. So when I got to this part, I was very, very interested, but the coding is kind of keeping me frustrated. It's yeah. What, what am I doing right and wrong? Because I don't get what right. I'm, the reason why I joined the course right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. I hear you. Um, so what I would say is, um, let me see if I can share a different screen here. There we go. Oh, shift. Um, so now, 
we have uh, should be able to see the screen. I'm, I'm following up on an answer, uh, Daniel. Um, so if I go in to a similar type of analysis in SAM, uh, this is you know the, the the software that we've been looking at for some time. Uh, at least we've introduced to you, excuse me, that, but we will be working with this for some time over the semester. And I choose a commercial project. I've got a photovoltaic project that is commercial. And I hit okay. And what's gonna happen is the location and the resource is gonna come up just like this. And the data source is gonna be a TMY data set. And I will view the weather file data like this. Uh, let's see if I can, uh, Make sure that I share that window as well. I'll just do it with the desktop. So there we go. So the um, so I've got listed on this data set a global irradiance data set, and I could plot over that a beam irradiance or uh, DNI data set, and I can grab even a specific day. Actually, there we go. Two specific days where I'm plotting the diffuse and the global, and I, actually that's DNI, not beam. Uh, so I've got diffuse and global measurements right here. Um, right now, that data looks about as real as it can be. And it seems like that's going to be a great data set to uh, run my simulations on because I could just hit uh, simulate and I will get right out off the bat, the actual energy that I would be expecting to produce over a 20 year, in year one, but this would be a, a 20 year estimate of, of production. The, um, the problem is that when I went back and looked at the resource data, again, what I find out is that the data itself, global, beam, and diffuse, if I go into the help files and beyond, I find out that that data is actually some very canned data. So it, it is typical meteorological year data. It is an approximation of one year of data repeated as many years as, as you have. And that works great for what we are working towards at the end of this class, which is pre-proposal design. But when you're talking about a one to two megawatt solar array, that's gonna take up about uh, five to 10 acres of land or more because the solar projects are getting bigger and bigger. That's a pretty uh, large capital investment and people want to be able to know how they can manage risk for that investment. The, uh, the, the next thing that goes on is putting out pyranometers or pure heliometers, the direct measurement device, into the field to collect for, say, a year or more. And you have different investors who are looking for different assurances of the quality of that data. And so you can have new places or new regions uh, where they want years of data collection. And what we're trying to work towards in an understanding of here is that that measured data, that, that real data that's gonna be coming in is much more uh, nuanced and complicated, but it has a significant amount of data processing just to get into using it inside of simulation tools like we're seeing right here uh, that help us to combine the performance of the solar power with the financial analysis of that system. And inside of the location and resource data also. Let's see if I can find that here. I've got my annual averages here, but if I go to try to find the part of that as we're gonna move to, if I, um, might be in system design. Yeah. Um, the way that I deal with light is that I find out that the, the data that I have has to be manipulated in an additional step. And that's where we're gonna go in lesson four, is to understand how the, the solar data that we take in as a measured data set is manipulated to estimate our components of light. Um, yeah, so the name of the class, Solar Resource Assessment and Economics, the assessment part becomes 
so fundamental to managing risk in larger solar projects that it's become an important part of our educational arc inside of the REST program and the solar certificate. The use of a tool like SAM for rooftop solar, say, very direct, very easy, but those are also not necessarily the, the, the types of career opportunities that are, uh, I mean, th they can be done from a, a sales perspective, from a, uh, a beginning developer's perspective, very easily used, very directly. I'm trying to also give you all the skills that you'll need for also taking on the trend of utility scale solar development in addition to those rooftop scenarios. Got it. Does that provide additional information for you? And I'm, I'm happy to, to, to keep discussing it either by, by on the forum or in another meeting as well. Um, well I see that we're running at 315 right now, and so I'm, I wanna be cognizant of people's time. But um, Daniel, I'd love to hear back on that perspective. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy with the way we are going. I'll set up another time. If the that sounds good. Of, yeah, if the rest of the team are being run by that, I can set up another time so that we can meet again so that I'll understand a little bit about uh, the Jupiter. Yeah. And then in coming classes. Right, exactly. I mean, and essentially what's happening is now we have, we're having larger and larger cohorts of students coming in. And so everything that, that you are providing as feedback to me, I value very, very highly. Uh, because, you know, in the uh, la first couple of years, the majority of people coming in were primarily already uh, uh, predominantly engineers that were, where intense calculations and, and, and uh, computational tools were kind of a norm a norm for them. The, the cohort is, that we have now is, is shifting and it's becoming a much more diverse skill set. And so as I get feedback from you, it's something that I can value to uh, push back into the class both while we're in it real time, but also in consideration of a, say a changing uh, uh, group of skills coming in with, with new students uh, in future offerings. That's good. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, just my two cents to whatever we have this stuff. We, we use the SAM tool a lot in most of our pre sales process when we're engaging with customers. In, in right. Yeah. yeah. So you do use SAM? Yeah. Quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a very good user interface and it's, it's great. And every time they're updating it, they're improving the way that things report out in terms of data. And it begins a very good discussion between you and the client. So in that sense, it is, it is powerful. What, if we go back to thinking about this class, we want to get a little bit deeper in to understand where its weaknesses are and, um, and to be aware of them, um, especially when we're talking about say higher risk uh, investments or larger investments in projects. Right. Anyone else? This has been very helpful. I need to go back and chew on some of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so, so keep an eye out. Um, I'm going to be spending the rest of the afternoon myself working and passing back and forth into, uh, the forums, which, uh, the question is, are we right now, uh, Randy and Sean, I don't know, know who else, but uh, we're passing the information inside of the general questions forum. Um, my, my question to you guys is, is that the best place or should we also, should we shift it to the discussion forum for the assignment itself? If we can get into the discussion forum, that would be also helpful to me. I don't know. Right. I, I'm fine with that. I just didn't want to, uh, because we're, yeah. being, we're, we're supposedly being graded on that one. So I didn't want to put like, you know, just more general or specific questions to the coding I was doing into that. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good, I mean, that, that's a good feedback. Uh, so, um, but for my perspective as well, I'm looking at what you are inputting 
into that general forum, all of all of you who have done that, to me that that's deeply tied to what I'm even assessing in the discussion activity too, because it's reveal it might not be answering the explicit questions that we were looking at, but it's identifying uh, any observations we have. So I think um, given that all uh, that feedback, Sean, I think it sounds like um, we should leave this discussion in the general questions so that everybody feels clear to respond in the uh, in the discussion activity. Uh, but uh, but I will remain very cognizant of your inputs in the general discussion uh, in assessing the learning activity itself. Okay. All right. Got it. And and will you be uh, posting this uh, the Python yes. that I just went yes. through? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But the main thing I want to do is I I want to do a double check on a couple of things just uh, so that I don't send and send and send revisions. Uh, I would love to have a little more of it tied down. Uh, so keep an eye out in about the next hour. I should be pushing it back out as a file. Okay. And is that, so is that assignment due today then? Tomorrow. I mean, that was the other thing. Based on your feedback, I pushed the assignment deadline to tomorrow. And, and quite honestly, you know, I will be okay with late submissions in this one uh, because we're all under uh, timelines of our jobs and families in addition to uh, the class itself. So yeah, I, I would worry. Yeah, go ahead. It, it was just, yeah, it was a little tough to get all the, the reading done, which is pretty significant. On pretty significant, the, yep. On top of the, yeah. you know, troubleshooting the Python coding and, um, yep. yeah, so. <clears throat> if, so let, yeah, let, a little bit more time so, would be helpful. No problem. So let's take pressure off of you guys on that. Give it a little breathing room. Uh, I pushed it to tomorrow, but with the understanding that if it if the submissions come in later, we really uh, I will really be tolerant of that. Okay. So I will set up another time. I know today you're very busy. I was yeah. I'll send an email and then set another time. With you. Thank you, Daniel. I would love to do that. You're welcome, sir. All right, folks. Thank you for your time. And uh, any last comments? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good All right, guys. Uh, this is recorded, and so we will share it uh, with Jen and the others uh, coming up. Okay. As soon as I determine how to push that onto Canvas. Thanks, all. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care.